Good morning, everyone. And congratulations to Bayfront again for this market opening and for the listing of your second transaction, the infrastructure asset backed securitization. We are going to be talking for the next uh, 45 minutes or so on climate transition in Asia and how sustainable in in infrastructure financing structures and solutions are going to be helping to move the market. So um, without further ado, I would just like each of the panelists to just really briefly introduce yourselves, your name and your title, please. Sure, thanks, Harry. I'm Nicholas Tan, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Bayfront Infrastructure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lavan. I'm a Deputy Executive Director at Infrastructure Asia. Morning, everyone. I'm Mina. I'm from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and I'm the head of the Infrastructure Funds uh, Trade Finance and Insurance Development Division. And a very good morning also from my side. I'm Helga, I'm head of Asia Pacific for Sustainable Finance and Global Capital Markets at ING. And, and hello, second. everyone. And hello, I'm everyone. Stephen from AIB. Um, I'm the person yeah. who's leading AIB's investment into Bayfront as a minority uh, investor. And I'm also a board member of Bayfront. Wonderful. So, Stefan, I think I might start with you since you're the last to speak. Um, can you perhaps, uh, in your capacity as a highly innovative uh, multilateral development bank that really focused on um, infrastructure first of all but also i really really find the whole concept of capital recycling more and more of the balance sheet of mdb is really really innovative so can you share just a little bit more about infrastructure development the role that it plays in financing the climate tr transition that must happen in asia sure thank you harry um so i set up 2015 um, so we are in our sixth year of operations. Uh, one of our one of our focus um, strategies is mobilization of private capital. So basically, when we first started off, we realized that 20, pay, 20 billion in paid in capital and um, 80 billion in, in callable capital is just not enough. We need to do more. So when we kind of looked around, uh, we realized that there is a whole bunch of money on the institutional investor side. So we focused on how to get those institutional investors, pensioners, lifers, uh, asset managers into infrastructure market in Asia. Um, and we realized that one way to do it is to help them um, by packaging um, products that kind of fit their appetite really well. Um, so obviously those would be something akin to what Mayfront um, has issued in terms of CLOs. So higher rating, uh, standardized, um, you have, um, it's a securities market rather than a bill. So the capital kind of recycling from the bank market, which has traditionally kind of finance infrastructure, uh, we took that um, kind of theme and we want to help institutional investors kind of get into that market. And we feel that Bayfront is a perfect example of how to do that. In terms of our sustainability, uh, we have a, also a global, of sustainability. So we help our um, members, so we have 103 members uh, meet their commitment they have entered into with the Paris Agreement. So obviously sustainability uh, is part of what we do. So we are super excited that Bayfront was able to um, structure a sustainability trunk uh, for this first debut securitization of their program, uh, which we feel is super exciting for us. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for that, Stefan. Thanks for setting the scene. So maybe I'll move to Lavan. What do you have to say about the role that um, you know infrastructure financing has to play in Asia for climate transition? Uh, thanks for the question, Harry. Uh, so there, there are various reports out there on um, talking about the infrastructure investment needs, right? You have ADB, you have the Global Infrastructure Hub, and most recent, you have the Tomasi Bain and Microsoft study the broad consensus is that a Southeast Asia would need about two to three trillion US dollars over the next decade in infrastructure investments. Or think about it another way, we probably need about 200 billion per year from now till 2030 
to switch to a greener, more sustainable, and to remain globally competitive. So this is across sectors, tra power, transport, telecommunications, water and sanitation, and water and sanitation has become even more pronounced with the pandemic. That many governments globally are pandemic strained further highlights the important role that private capital must play in climate investments. The ADB estimates that about 40% of infrastructure investment must come from the private sector. I think this number is going to increase over time. Yet currently, there are some estimates that say that only 20% of the annual demand is met through the supply of green finance. So we have a long way to go, but there's room for optimism. Let's look at it from the demand and the supply side. From the demand side, infrastructure spending is viewed by governments in the region as a way to stimulate the economy towards recovery, to create jobs, especially those lost through the pandemic. So regional governments have renewed emphasis towards sustainable and resilient infrastructure. They have pri reprioritized their infrastructure needs with areas such as renewables, digital connectivity, logistics, et cetera. And these are going to increase in importance. And examples of this are, for example, if you look at the Philippines, you have the Build, Build, Build program. You, in Indonesia, you have SDG Indonesia 1. Or in India, you can look at the National Infrastructure Pipeline. So further, the World Bank reports highlights that investing in resilient infrastructure delivers benefits to emerging markets with $4 in benefits for every $1 invested. So switching to the supply side, as countries gear up to accelerate the deployment of prioritized infrastructure projects, they face challenges in attracting quality international players to invest and develop the project. Therein lies the opportunity and the need for proven technology, solution providers, and sophisticated funds to fill this gap. So just to pick up on yeah, that, uh, Lavan, sure. so we've already now discussed the role that, uh, you know, multilateral banks can play and, um, you know, entities like Infrastructure Asia, how they can help deploy more resources. Let's move to Mina. So can you share a little bit more about what, what further needs to be done? Because it's clear that sustainable financing is, is needed for sustainable infrastructure. Would you like to share your views? Sure. So you know, on the role of uh, infrastructure, I think there's, uh, you know, complete certainty, right, that it's a key part of the uh, region or the global, right, uh, transition for a more sustainable future because infrastructure development and the related financing of it really meets uh, three key needs that Asia has. Firstly, to address the infrastructure gap. I think this was talked about earlier, right? Um, the need for sanitation, better transport and energy that really... Um, uplifts people's lives, uh, and this is very important uh, in many emerging markets in Asia. Secondly, uh, infrastructure itself, of course, has an environmental footprint, uh, and improving that uh, environmental performance right, of the assets is very important. Um, and at the same time, infrastructure is also impacted by climate, um, and we live in a part of the world, right? Asia is particularly um, um, at risk right, due to the increasing frequency and severity of natural catastrophes. Um, and as such, really, you know, more climate resilient infrastructure um, ticks all these boxes. I think it's really important. Thirdly, uh, Lavin talked about economic stimulus, uh, growing jobs, uh, and generating, right, more economic activity. And in that sense, you know, infrastructure development, sustainable infrastructure development really hits these three needs for Asia. And that's why when you talk about, uh, and when you see, right, governments in the region, municipalities, when they announce, um, you know, their uh, Paris alignment plans, when they announce their plans for net zero future, um, invariably infrastructure development actually is a huge part of it, whether it's renewable energy, uh, greener vehicles, um, sanitation. Uh, and in Singapore, this is also the case, right, with the Singapore Green Plan, where you see uh, whether it's our plans for quadrupling solar energy, for greener HDB estates, um, um, that infrastructure is really a core part um, of climate transition. So I think there are two key parts here, really, in terms of what's needed, right? Talking about um, challenges, right? Scale, uh, Lavan has given uh, great figures, right? Uh, on the sheer amount of spending that's required um, and the need to crowd in more private capital. 
uh, because about 90% currently, right, of infrastructure spending is on public budgets. And 75% of uh, green financing in ASEAN is actually from public spending. So this uh, proportion does need to change. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Mina. So let's, let's get down to the nuts and bolts now. Um, let, let's set the scene. So, um, Nicholas, what are we seeing today to be the main solutions, right? What, what's innovative, what needs to be scaled? And of course, you've got a, a great transaction to uh, share, share more about. But what is the current state of play? What are the main financing structure solutions in the market that we see in Asia for infrastructure financing? Sure. Thanks, Harry. I think in addition to you know, project loans, project bonds, and I think Helga can probably add on to that, of course, um, we have launched the Infrastructure SFX Securities um, since 2018. Uh, the IABS is a structured note that we have designed at Bayfront to help institutional investors to participate in infrastructure debt in a liquid and credit-enhanced format. This is very much aligned with our mission at Bayfront to help address the significant infrastructure financing gap in Asia through the mobilization of private capital and helping banks at the same time recycle capital into new projects. So this creates a very positive feedback loop to get more and more projects developed. The design of the IABS was deliberate in trying to address some of the structural barriers to entry that we have identified for institutional investors trying to participate in this space. For example, given that transactions and jurisdictions tend to be fairly bespoke in Asia, we believe that banks continue to be the most well-equipped to originate and structure these transactions, hold them through the construction period of these projects before transferring these exposures into institutional balance sheets once the underlying projects have achieved completion status. Other barriers to entry that we have identified includes some investment grade ratings, difficulty in addressing diversification, liquidity, resourcing consideration, so on and so forth. The IABS enables investors to gain an immediate exposure to a diversified portfolio of high-quality infrastructure loans curated by Bayfront. Investors can pick and choose from a range of investment-grade rated securities, and it comes with structural protections such as coverage tests and first-loss buffers provided by Bayfront. Investors are also able to benefit from Bayfront specialists origination, structuring, and domain, uh, uh, portfolio management capabilities, and it affords investors with greater liquidity given that these securities are listed and traded on the SGX. So overall, our objective in delivering the IABS is to create uh, a, a product, a solution that can become mainstream, thereby mobilizing a broader segment of the institutional market to participate. Thanks, Nicholas. So Helga, would you like to provide from, I'm sure you're seeing many transactions in the market. So in particular, when it comes to sustainable infrastructure, what is the current state of play and what are the main solutions and structures that you're seeing? Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Before I go to the actual answer, I think one thing that is really important to mention is that what we need at the moment, by the way, is speed and quantum. Right? If we take a step back, what's the purpose? Why are we discussing what we are discussing here today? If you look at the latest IPCC report, we know that we have to decarbonize the global economy by around 50% by 2030. And infrastructure is gonna be absolutely critical. So I want to start by saying we need speed and quantum, more or less nothing less than a revolution. Um, I would like to compliment a little bit what Nicholas said because I think we really have to highlight the why. Why is the IABS so important? Um, a couple of numbers were already floated. Our numbers are even bigger. ING Research has recently uh, published something where they tried to quantify the capital needed just to transition the transport sectors in Japan, China, and Korea. We came to 12.4 trillion. If you annualize that, that's roughly for China 1.8% of GDP per year. It's actually achievable. It sounds very, very large, but it's actually achievable if you annualize it. But it's a lot. Now, Focusing on the why of the IABS being so important because we need product innovation, I always hear people, yeah, we live in an ultra low interest rate environment, there's an abundance of capital, but if you drill a bit deeper, we actually have a couple of issues. 
If I focus on institutional capital, yeah, it's growing, nice. Probably have now more than 200 billion of assets under management and infrastructure focused funds, that's good. But it's really still dominated by EMEA and the Americas. And if you then look into Asia Pacific as a region, it's very much focused on the developing country, developed countries like Japan, Korea, and Australia. So if you actually drill a bit deeper into it, uh, you see that we have a monumental task still ahead of ourselves. Now, if you look at institutional investors, a couple of key constraints that they have. One is the technical knowledge around all these assets they're meant to finance. And very often also the fact that they can't generate diversified portfolios. And this is exactly what Bayfront accommodates. They're addressing the issue of technical capabilities because there's a process in place based on which these assets are vetted and they allow investors to invest in a diversified portfolio. So this is what we exactly need, this product innovation to really unlock capital because banks will also remain constrained. There's Basel IV, which is not really positive for long dated secured assets. So I think this is absolutely the future, these types of transactions. Thanks, Helga. So you're talking about a, uh, a systemic shift in some ways needed because of the way that the banks will have to be deploying, you know, the types of loans that need to be deployed for these sort of long tenor, uh, long economic life assets. So um, let, let's stay on the current state of play and just looking slightly more forward. Um, I want to come back to you, um, Nicholas. So what other recent developments and trends are you seeing? Sure. One of the key developments or trends that we observed over the course of the last six to 12 months was the exponential growth in investors' focus on ESG and sustainability. I think everybody is aware that the path is fairly certain and not surprising, but it's really the pace of change that is something that was unexpected. For example, the first question that we get in almost many of the investor meetings during the marketing of our BIC2 transaction that we're here to commemorate was, are you expecting to have core transactions in your target portfolio? And of course, we were glad to say categorically no. And Bayfront is very much aligned to that thematic. Like many financial institutions, we have excluded coal-fired power generation from our loan selection criteria. But we went beyond that and excluded any form of coal-related transactions, such as your coal mining, coal transportation, ancillary facilities, for example. We've also developed our own ESG frameworks to help us analyze ESG risks and a new sustainable finance framework that was published in March this year to guide the structuring of our sustainability issuances going forward. Our sustainable finance framework is aligned with market standards so that investors can get comfort that they are investing into uh, categories of green and social assets that are directly linked to SDGs. And we've leveraged on this framework to issue our first sustainability tranche that was mentioned by Promot uh, during the earlier event as part of the BIC2 transaction. Another interesting development that we observed, especially through the sustainability tranche, was the fact that investors are starting to acknowledge and accept that sustainability deserves a greenium, a green premium. We demonstrated that by achieving a five basis points pricing differential between the sustainability tranche and the equivalent conventional tranche within our BIC2 transactions. I think this was something that we would not have been able to achieve if we were marketing this transaction in 2019 or pre-COVID. And this shows that going forward, demand for sustainable infrastructure financing will continue to accelerate and we at Bayfront are certainly committed to pioneer innovative financing solution to catalyze more institutional participation through the energy transition journey in Asia. Just really briefly, Nicholas, what, what do you think led to that premium? I think it's really a focus on the fact that a sustainable world is something that we all have to work towards to. And that recognition really was triggered by the COVID pandemic where there was a complete shift in that perspective. I think, like I mentioned earlier, the direction of change is something that is not surprising. I think everybody is aware and it's, it's acutely uh, uh, sensitive to the fact that we need to move to a more sustainable world. But 
I think it's the COVID situation that catalyzed that immediate pace of change that um, focused people on more sustainability issuances, thereby enabling us to achieve sufficient oversubscription, thereby enabling us to price the two tranches differently. Thanks for that. So we're also certainly seeing that trend where there is a recognition by the investors that capital flow is needed and that uh, all, all tools need to be pulled for them to actually put more money towards that. Um, so you've mentioned about uh, increasing sort of deployment of exclusionary screening or policies around fossil fuel and uh, broader ESG integration as well. Um, Levan, would you like to add anything to that? What kind of development and trends are you further seeing? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this question in two parts. Uh, firstly, a little bit more of a macro perspective, and then I, I want to spend maybe a little bit of time to talk about it from an Infrastructure Asia perspective. So from a macro perspective, uh, there are various work streams, both completed and ongoing, to help guide the flow of sustainable finance. And we should be supportive of this work because we are still at quite an early stage, so we should be supportive of this work. It can be at the national level, multilateral level, or even from the perspective of industry organizations, ICMA, loan market associations, we should be supportive. Specific to infrastructure, this work has been carried on for a couple of years already. You know, there's the Inter-American Development Bank's framework for planning and preparing and how to finance sustainable infrastructure projects. One of the latest pieces of work that is actually quite exciting is the finance to accelerate the sustainable transition infrastructure or fast infrastructure, uh, which was conceived by the Climate Policy Initiative, HSBC, IFC, OECD, and the Global Infrastructure Facility. It's an exciting in, uh, initiative. It aims to transform sustainable infrastructure into a mainstream liquid asset class, right? So through this labeling system, the market can easily signal the sustainability of an asset and investors can trust that the money is going into the project to meet ESG and contribute towards SDG goals. So I think that's a, quite an exciting piece of work. Second, I want to share uh, some of the work that Infrastructure Asia is doing on this front to enable more sustainable infrastructure. First, we launched something called the Asia Sustainable Infrastructure Advisory Panel. It's chaired by Minister Indrani Raja. It was launched in June this year, and it aims to build the region's knowledge and awareness on sustainable infrastructure by sharing trends, ideas, and best practices. So the inaugural meeting will be in November this year. The Asia Panel consists of experts on sustainable infrastructure who will share both their economic and financial perspectives across the entire infrastructure value chain. As a regional hub for sustainable infrastructure, we seek to build on these strengths and to accelerate the development of sustainable infrastructure in the region. Second, Infrastructure Asia has developed several capacity building programs, such as the Growing Infrastructure Course, whereby regional government officials are invited to thematic courses to learn how to enable sustainable infrastructure within their markets. This course is launched by Infrastructure Asia and the World Bank Group with Singapore Management University as our academic partner. And it aims to equip government officials with the knowledge and the skills to create a regulatory environment that will enable sustainable infrastructure. So it combines the cost, it combines the strengths of each of the partners, Infrastructure Asia's connections to the regional ecosystem, SMU's industry collaboration and the World Bank Group's global development expertise. So why are we doing this? I think collectively, we are building the next generation of regional leaders in sustainable infrastructure. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, that capacity building is such an important part to continue to get everyone up the knowledge curve, right? To be able to make the right decisions. Um, I'd, I'd just like to come back to you, you know, about what you said about we need to crowd in and what many of our um, participants already said. Um, so moving forward from here, right? What, what, what are the real key bottlenecks to crowding more institutional capital that you may be seeing? And what are the potential solutions that really have the potential to frog leap us into, into solving these bottlenecks? What are you seeing? Yeah, thanks. Oh, oh sorry. Um, so essentially, I want to um, say that Infrastructure development, right, uh, in Asia and in many emerging markets, face a set of challenges 
um, you know, whether it's infrastructure or sustainable infrastructure, challenges including political risk, currency risk, um, governance uh, challenges, uh, and the lack of, uh, you know, conducive policy or regulatory frameworks. And these would continue to be the case, right, uh, including for sustainable infrastructure. But I'm going to focus more on the additional overlay that sustainable infrastructure uh, brings with it. So firstly, let me talk about enablers. I think uh, definitions and data are two key enablers. So within the definition space, uh, there must be a common language, right, uh, or interoperability, right, uh, to ensure that there's clarity in the market as to what's considered a green, right, or sustainable infrastructure. Um, and that's why we see efforts, right, to develop, uh, for instance, taxonomies, because that enables investors to move with confidence and at scale uh, you know, infrastructure specific efforts include the fast infrastructure, sustainable label that uh, Levin talked about. Uh, and at the uh, broader, bigger, more macroeconomic level, uh, we also see taxonomies developing. So in Singapore, MES is supporting industry's efforts uh, to develop a taxonomy that financial institutions can use that's applicable to the region as well um, for to identify activities that are green or in transition to being green. Um, and these, uh, this taxonomy, which is in development, actually has good links with the infrastructure sector. Many of the activities in there, uh, you know, are linked to real estate, construction, uh, transport and energy. And at the same time, we're also bringing this approach, supporting ASEAN's efforts at developing a taxonomy that's inclusive, that takes into account uh, social and economic considerations and different starting points uh, of the various economies. So that's one uh, in terms of definitions. Second key enabler, of course, is data, because that really powers and supports financial decision making. Um, and there needs to be granular, right, uh, climate risk related data on infrastructure assets in Asia. And this is lacking. Uh, MAS is supporting the efforts of ad hack infra to develop a climate risk uh, database for infrastructure assets globally. Uh, that basically does physical mapping, right, of um, assets that have high footprint and impact, right, on the climate, right, and at the same time uh, on the reverse, how climate is going to impact uh, infrastructure assets as well. So that's in the enabler space. Let me come on to financing now. Um, there's actually a big range, right, uh, of stakeholders and actors in the financial system, uh, whether we're talking about institutional investors, whether we're talking about uh, the global public investors, pension funds, uh, whether we're talking about private wealth, um, as well as uh, uh, impact investors with interest to grow and scale green financing. There is uh, interest in that. Uh, and that includes in the area of climate resilient and sustainable infrastructure. So MAS's role here really has been to grow this base of investors uh, in Singapore to look much more closely and really grow their capabilities uh, in looking at infrastructure in the Asian space, connecting with key actors, uh, convening them and supporting them, right, uh, in their efforts to really connect uh, to new areas uh, and new ways of structuring uh, infrastructure financing. So Bayfront Infrastructure, of course, is a prime example, right, of a, a more innovative way right, of structuring infrastructure financing uh, in the way that it enables uh, recycling Right, of banks' balance sheets, expands banks' financing capacity, and at the same time, diversifies that uh, base of investors who can look um, at their infrastructure asset bit uh, securities. The final point here I want to make on structuring, of course, is that there is capital, as I said before, but it's about how uh, the different risk return appetites right, of these various groups of investors uh, are kind of uh, matched, and public spending is used not so much as the bulk of it, but really to in intelligently structure, uh, to crowd in, right, uh, some of the additional capital uh, and to de-risk certain parts and combine with technical assistance. Thanks for that, Mina. So, um, Stefan, we haven't forgotten about you. I'll come back to you just, just, just in one moment. But Helga, so what are you seeing in the trenches of making deals happen? Actually, I wanted to just build on what Mina just said because you spoke my heart on a couple of things and one was risk return. Um, I think we've all established that we understand the importance of sustainability. But one bottleneck is still risk return. Yeah, whether it's a bank or an institutional investor is looking at this. As a bank, for example, we have committed many years ago already to align our global lending book with Paris. We're also part of net zero banking. What does it mean? It means that we are steering our portfolio 
away from unsustainable towards more sustainable activities, infrastructure being a key part of that. Having said that, we're still a bank, we need to uh, assess risk and return. So a couple of levers here, for example, as a bank, we benefit from what we call the infrastructure support factor. So if an infrastructure asset adheres to certain criteria, we can actually reduce the risk rated assets by 25%. And that's a really, really big delta for us as a bank. So point being, there can be regulatory support, can also be if we go a bit deeper into the concessions around uh, an infrastructure asset and so on and so forth. The second part on risk return, again, is also that all the investors have a little bit of a different lens. And coming back to what I said earlier, for me, the Bayfront transaction is absolutely key for the future because it actually very intelligently allows to slice and dice the liability structure to exactly accommodate each investor's needs in terms of risk and reward. So we really have to look not only at the sustainability angle, is my point, we also need to risk, uh, look at risk and return, and Bayfront, to me, is a prime example of how to address that. Thanks for that, Helga. So, um, Stefan, um, you've been talking to lots of investors about crowding in institutional capital. So what are the key challenges and possible solutions that you're seeing that can scale, hopefully, over time? Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough nut to crack, right? So I think we understand what the, what the issues are. We understand. Um, you know, what the challenges are. I think from an institutional investor's perspective, um, it's important, like Hubble was saying, the vast quantum amount is very important. So if you want a vast quantum amount, um, infrastructure assets or emerging market infrastructure assets um, needs to transform into a separate asset class. And I think what that means is, you know, every year institutional investors, they will, uh, with the new money coming in, they will allocate to a certain asset passage, right? Like Japanese government, one five percent U.S. You know, tech, tech stocks, and two percent, and they just kind of go down the list. I, I don't think right now um, sustainable infrastructure or emerging market sustainable infrastructure is an asset class as established. So the benefit of having that asset class approach, of way of approaching the capital markets, is significant. Um, if you can kind of get to an asset class, that means every institutional investor who wants to do this will go out and hire a team. Um, and every year, um, they will have an allocation on capital. Now, that's very, very powerful, right? It's not an opportunistic way of looking at investments, but it's a sustainable uh, every year. You know, someone's going to look at it every year. They're looking for assets. So how do you establish that asset class? I think there's a couple components. Um, of any asset classes. One is primary. There needs to be a consistent primary issuance. The second one is secondary markets. So this is different from a loan market. The securities world, the institutional investors, they want liquidity, right? They want to be able to get out when they want to get out. Um, the third one will be valuation and the ease of valuation, right? Um, the third, and then the fourth one will be a benchmark uh, because institutional investors as a fair value instrument, they would like to understand how they're forming against um, against the benchmark. So those are four of the key ingredients, I would say, in establishing an asset class. And only then will an institutional investor, a large one, would would sign on and say, yes, this is an, this is an asset class. We would like to get into it. So I think Bayfront, uh, with its PIC issuances, is doing exactly that, um, especially the first part, which is providing primary issuances on a regular basis, right? So this is the second one, and hopefully Bayfront will continue to issue, um, you know, have an issuance every year. That will confirm and prove to institutional investors that this is an asset class that's worthy of them uh, hiring people, setting up a team. Um, so the next kind of couple other areas that, you know, we should be exploring altogether is how do you formulate a benchmark that's easy to track, that's easy to formulate, that, that can be rep, you know, rep, replicatable. Um, what do you do in the secondary market? You know, obviously about the valuation and you know, what is the ease in terms of valuation and transparency. So for institutional investors, I think the formation of an asset class, I think is super important. So AIB in our policy, we have stated that as a vision for us and we have a vision to support the establishment of emerging market infrastructure as an asset class. 
Thanks, Stefan. So I, I think what you're saying with all these uh, um, issues and solutions you're talking about, that uh, AIB will continue to be the anchor investor. Can, can we rely on you? <laughs> um, I think we should be all relying on each other. But we will definitely do our part um, because AIB is a multilateral, um, you know, funded by 103 countries around the world. Obviously, Singapore is a, is a very important member for us. So we would like to collaborate with with you know with our members uh, and their and their institutions uh, like Clifford Capital to establish these things and to help nurture support anchor and I think uh, Levan was also mentioning a lot of good work is being done by IFC the World Bank ADB um, so AIB wants to contribute um, our share into help establish this I think um, we definitely want to explore and continue to explore how to work closely together with all the efforts that um, the Singapore government is doing on this front. Thanks, Stefan. Um, Nicholas, is there anything you would like to add on to what's been shared so far? Yeah, sure. I, I think what I have in mind is really tying in with what the rest have talked about. In my view, I think the one of the key challenges is really the fact that the current market ecosystem for infrastructure financing for sustainable financing is still very much focused and calibrated for banks as financiers and not necessarily sufficiently conducive for institutional investors to participate in scale. What do I mean by that? Let me just give you a couple of examples to illustrate that. Number one, um, disclosure and traceability. Uh, Stefan alluded earlier that investors in the capital markets generally require information transparency and liquidity. And this is an area that I believe Infrastructure Asia has done a great job in trying to promote standardization of documentation that seeks to enhance public disclosure and also transferability of loans and securities. However, from I think where we see, this is something that sponsors in general continue to resist to a certain extent given that um, you know, they, they continue to operate on a similar basis uh, with, with banks. So in order for us to create a liquid and tradable secondary market for infrastructure debt, we do need to be able to open that aspect of the ecosystem. Example two, market incentives or economic incentives. I think that there is currently insufficient um, policy-driven economic incentives uh, for in institutional investors to move into this space in a scalable format. For example, if we sort of take um, capital charges for insurance companies uh, as, 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 a, as something to look into, there is no real differentiation or material differentiation between a corporate bond or project bond or a sustainable project bond, or there is no real material differentiation between a US bought list indicated CLO versus an infrastructure ABS versus a sustainable ABS. So in order for us to direct or mobilize institutional participation in mass into this space, we need to have policy-driven economic incentives to move people there because this is an important aspect when people consider relative value. And third example that I will mention would be currency mismatch. I think we're all seeing the trend that sponsors are moving increasingly towards local currency financing because the underlying contract base for projects are also moving into local currency denominations without US dollar indexation. So there is a gap in currency given the fact that global investors will continue to demand assets denominated in hard currencies such as US dollars. So there needs to be a solution that addresses that the current market hedging solutions are um, inadequate depending on which are the currency pairs. Even for the more liquid currencies, there are issues around you know, unwinding costs due to prepayments, defaults, and so on and so forth. So there could potentially be a need for maybe a multilateral uh, type of solution in order for us to, to breach that gap. I think we can talk about a number of examples, but overall, the the, the thinking is that we probably need to move the entire ecosystem with all the actors you know, playing a part in trying to create an environment and a market that's conducive for institutional investors to participate in scale. 
Thanks for that. So um, we've got just about six minutes left. So just really briefly, Lavan, um, anything else that you really think will catalyze the market for solutions to scale? Uh, yeah, I think maybe I'll, I'll just focus uh, on, on two points. Uh, one is capacity and the other is risk allocation. Um, so the region as a whole has struggled to furnish uh, sufficient supply in the form of bankable projects to match the long-term institutional capital needs. It can be attributed to a lack of capacity and resources to, to prepare some projects. So therefore, upstream project preparation is a critical first step to make infrastructure projects bankable. The good news is that there are many project development funds out there. Uh, infrastructure Asia's own count puts it at somewhere between 25 to 30. It's heartening to hear the announcement last week from Tamasi and HSBC as well that uh, you know infrastructure projects have several challenges and therefore uh, degrees to the bankability vary and therefore private capital can play a role. Uh, the second point I, I want to talk about is just on uh, the, the point about um, bespoke financing structures. Right, uh, Nicholas talked about it. Uh, Infrastructure Asia started this effort to um, standardize about 50% of the terms in project finance loan documents. Uh, remaining clauses will remain customizable to the deal. And these were drafted together with Clifford Chance, Ellen and Gladhill with the support of the APLMA. So the standardization of these clauses actually is an important step toward expediting and reducing the cost of project finance and therefore narrowing the infrastructure investment gap. I hear what uh, Nicholas was sharing. We are working very hard, Nicholas. Uh, you know, we have socialized this idea with over 350 lawyers, in-house bankers, third country collaborators, and now we're starting to work with regional governments and maybe there's a role to have some of these in PPP contracts. Great, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So let's think global for a moment. All of the discussions we're having now, these are all culminating in the discussions at COP26 in November. Now, Stefan, um, what are you preparing for? What's AIB and the MDB institutions? Um, you know, we, we are aware that you're obviously talking to each other on how to scale collectively. So thinking about partnerships. Um, can you share a little bit more about uh, in the context of sustainable infrastructure? What are you working on? and to help Asia as well. Um, sure, so we have a target for, for climate in our corporate strategy we released last year. So for half of our target is by 2025, half of our uh, climate finance, um, half, half of our projects will be climate finance, will be climate aligned, which is you know a pretty, pretty big goal. And I think a lot of MDBs are working toward um, getting that ratio to be higher and higher. We do work with, the MDB community. So there is a there's a forum that we meet regularly. We do discuss uh, targets as well as assessments, taxonomies, as well as categorizing what is climate, what is not climate. Um, so I think that's kind of a role that we feel you know is, is very apt for us. Um, in terms of sustainable infrastructure, uh, specifically for climate, I think we 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 are thinking more and more that first of all we need to establish kind of the definition of of um, of climate. Right, so we 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 like we like Paris Agreement. We think Paris Agreement is actually kind of the top level, um, you know, top level um, document or kind of agreement that the global leaders have agreed on. So we want to be able to align with that. And I think we've been saying that we, you know, our members have committed to Paris Agreement, and we want to help our members, um, you know, meet those commitments. Right. So I think that's, that continues to be a very important part. And as you know, there's there's this whole discussion about for climate, for mitigation in, in Paris Agreement, for mitigation and adaptation. I think mitigation has been pretty well established, you know, more or less. Uh, and I think, you know, we're racing to to beat the time to get to 1.5 or at least 2 Celsius degree change. I think resilience, I think Laval was saying, um, resilience is, is not a factor that a lot of people talk about. So we want to do more work on the resilience part, the resilience adaptation, which is physical change, physical risk, more hurricanes, more extreme weathers, um, you know, like hotter weather, more rainfall, more flooding. I think that's an area that that we ourselves haven't you know, been focusing on much of mitigation. And I think that's an area that I think is very ripe for, for advancements and, uh, and uh, discussions. I think uh, COP26, there will be a lot more discussion on resilience uh, than in the, in the past COP. Thanks, Stefan. Um Helga, um, I want to come to you last before I just get last word from everyone else. So th the other key topic in COP26 this year, having more attention than it ever had, 
is that nexus between climate and nature. Um, and there's a, there's a whole day dedicated to nature, in fact, at COP26 this year. Do you have any, anything to add on how do we actually make this in practice a reality in Asia? Yeah, thanks. I think this is actually an exceptionally important question. Maybe just addressing the why. Why is it so important? The world is extremely focused on climate at the moment, and the reasons for that are quite obvious. If you look at scientific evidence, we have created quite a few issues by living beyond our means. And for two of these issues, already today, we are beyond planetary boundaries. Today, we are already in a high danger zone. And these two issues are biochemical flows and biodiversity, especially genetic biodiversity, which is kind of the information bank um, for, for organ organisms. And this has a very profound impact on businesses as well as humans, among others, having increased risks of pandemics. We're sitting here today with masks in our face. So bearing in mind that we are already beyond the planetary boundaries today on biodiversity and the significant impact it has, it has to become a big focus. Congrats that you're also part of the TNFD, which I think is great. Um, and as a bank, we are already tackling this. So number one, we have changed our governance. We have established new committees that are part of our governance structure tackling this. Um, the sustainability topics are very often complex, interconnected, sometimes short-term, even conflicting. So we've made sure that in our governance structure, we address that by tackling, for example, climate and biodiversity in one go and other areas as well. And secondly, we are already changing our processes. So the first step was to use ESR policies ultimately to, to avoid do harm by financing certain things, for example, deforestation. But the second step is now going to be quite interesting. So we are working together, for example, with the Natural Capital Finance Alliance on building models to effectively better understand the impact of our financings on biodiversity. So in short, extremely important topic, uh, and we are definitely having to tackle it. Yeah. So I hate to tell everyone in the audience, but climate which has really focused on climate mitigation to this point, including at the COPs. It is now going to be multifaceted, bringing in more of climate resilience and the nexus with nature. And um, let's not forget the social aspect that is so important in Asia. So it is going to be multifaceted. And the only way um, we can actually tackle this, right, is in partnership across the different parts of the not only the financial um, value chain but working together with the real economy and governments etc so uh, we really hope that we can bring together more conversations like this to bring to life what really needs to be done um, so just to round off um, any final just one sentence what would you like to take away for the audience maybe i can go first i'll just quote from a recent moody's research that was just published last week I think what they highlighted was the fact that in order for us to address the material infrastructure financing gap in Asia, we need both conventional financing solutions and innovative financing solutions like EIBS to scale up together and the entire ecosystem to come together in order for us to address this gap. Yeah, I think from my perspective, uh, we will be looking to ensure that the bankability of infrastructure projects, especially sustainable infrastructure projects in the in the region can increase so that the private capital can flow into this asset class. I think we know the problem statements, so let's uh, deploy scale and speed and work together. Also in one sentence, we need more financial innovators like Bayfront. Wonderful. So um, with that, the panel is coming to a close. I would really sincerely like to congratulate Bayfront again for the innovative um, issuance and listing of your second IABS with a sustainable tranche. Um, also to thank all of uh, Bayfront's key stakeholders in the room here today who could make it and our virtual audience as well. Very much so appreciated. So thank you again. Thank you to our panelists too.